So our, uh, our final speaker uh, uh, here this afternoon, uh, I'm really honored to uh, uh, introduce here Mr. Norman uh, Fleury, uh, who's a Métis elder and uh, uh, quite renowned uh, Métis elder, a very strong uh, voice in the, in the Métis movement. Uh, he was born and raised in St. Lazar, Manitoba, previously the director of Michif Language for the Manitoba Métis Federation, is a strong leader in the battle to preserve the Michif and Cree languages. He's written a uh, numerous translations into Michif and provided spoken word uh, record of Michif on the CDs that accompany books, and there are a number of books, and I'll invite you to uh, uh, check out this uh, impressive uh, lineup of books and, and uh, uh, scholarly works that he, is, uh, he has done. He's uh, served in many positions since joining the Manitoba Métis Federation uh, at its inception in 1967. So he's been doing this work and leading the way for a very, very long time. Norman was involved in opening Métis locals and holding elected positions as MMF chairman in Manitoba in Manitoba communities. He served as a provincial board of director representing the MMF Southwest region. We are very proud to have him here and we want to welcome him kindly to the stage, Mr. Norman Fleury. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for that introduction. I didn't know I did that much. <laughs> but I guess I'm going to be 67 years old on Monday. And um, I'm going to start off by telling you that I'm a very, very fortunate person because I had that opportunity to not only know who I am, but to grow up a real positive bona fide Michif. So sometimes people are confused between Michif and Metis. Michif is different in different ways, but politically, the Metis is used all across the homeland. But when you go to the United States, where our relatives are in Montana, in Belcourt, North Dakota, St. John, and um, Rolla, they still use that term, Michif. So I'm a Michif. But I should start off by making my introduction in my language. Norman My mother passed away six years ago. She was 108 years old. And she would be the fifth generation Michif. Like it was said today here at the podium. We were Michifs before Canada was a Canada. And we were Michif on the prairies when we were hunting buffalo. We were Michifs. And we flew that flag, I'm proud to say, in 1816 at the Battle of Seven Oaks when we start fighting for our rights. And that flag still stands and these other flags of our relatives, First Nations. I'm very proud to be a Michif and my grandmother always said to us, be proud. Don't be ashamed of who you are. Keep your heads high. And that's what we have to do is keep our heads high. I was 
one person that went to university, and I had a grade nine. And the program was called Impact, and that was in 1969. It was called the Indian and Métis Teachers' Careers. We were sort of like the guinea pigs at the beginning because people were saying, you need that education now to make out in this big world that we live in. But my grandparents didn't think that way. Neither did my mother. Because they were able to incorporate richness in their life by living off the land and by befriending the four-legged and the winged. And we knew our medicines. We were a powerful people. We knew our legends. We knew our stories. We knew our language. We knew who was we Sagejak and Nana Bush and Chija. And we told those stories during the winter time. If it wasn't for my grandparents, and that's where our education system came from, we've been an oral culture for many, many years. And then all of a sudden, we've become a writing, a writing culture. And now we have to tell our stories in English. We're anglicizing who we are. That is really hard when you ask an elder to tell their story in English when their first language is not English. I've interviewed many elders in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, and when we speak our language, we make such a connection through our, the spirit of our language. As soon as you say, Tanshe, Right away, you open up that relationship. Where are you from? What's your name? Oh, are you related to that person? Well, we find that bond right away. I know I wrote things down on my paper, but sometimes you're better off to let your heart talk for you. I was adopted by Dakota people. So I'm a Dakota by adoption. My Ina, my mother, she's gone now. She'd been in her 90s. And my brother, my Chia, he would be in this over 100. But because I worked on reserve or reserves in 1975, I was just a young man, and I work on Dakota and Soto reserves, which some people say Ojibwe now. When I was maybe in my early 20s, 21, 22, and they would say, I went in, Kabin to get, Muniasha, Habskoi I said, Kaarin, Danishina, Bem. That's how you build on relationships, and same as the Dakota. So the power of the language, the power of our culture, the spirits that's left there is very good, still today. This like the round dances and powwows. I worked with the elders at Chanupawakpa. <clears throat> Oak Lake Sioux it used to be, now it's Chanupawakpa. So we talk about 
the olden days because that was, that's what was strong. That's where the power was in the olden days. And then you start talking about things that are totally alien, like drugs and alcohol. We talk about an education system, but that's what we have to learn to combat. That's part of indigenizing. We have to learn to protect ourselves. My Kokum and my Morshom, they were born in about 1877 and 1879. They were the prairie people, they were the buffalo people. They knew the buffalo, they had a relationship with the buffalo. They traveled all across Canada and United States. In my genealogy, I have relatives that are Crow and Grovant because the beautiful looking woman that lived south came back, they came home with the Michif and they became Michif people. But it's sad that when the government was doing the census, they would put Suzette or Josette Indian or Grovant. They never said, or Indian. So that was discrimination already. But because of our oral culture, in wintertime when it was cold, by the firelight or the coal oil lamp, our grandparents would tell us stories. We're related to those people. They live a long ways from us. But they kept ties with the relation. And that was very important. The Michif people, the Métis, people are, have so many misconceptions about who we are. And Kitimagan, it's sad because we've been around for a long time. But everybody knew who we were. When they signed these land scripts, they called us half-breeds. Well, I'm not a half-breed, I'm double, if anything. And then they called us Métis, but we called ourselves Michif. And a relative of mine from Changaga, Watida, Bertail Sioux, George Bear, he was married to my grandfather's niece. So that's how we're related. It don't matter if people say you're a tenth cousin. We don't say that. We say that person's my cousin. That's what's important, that the strength of the relationship. So he said, you know, Norman, he called me his grandson, because that's the way the relationship was. If you're Konshi or Koko or Nokum were married to somebody that person's family, they became your, bro your, your grandmas and your grandpas. My mother's first cousins were her brothers and sisters. So we had that strong tie and start, strong, strong relationship. So George said, you know, your people were very good buffalo hunters. And it's not easy to hunt buffalo when it's 80 above. When you go on your spring hunt and the fall hunt, you people always wore hats, and it's, you're sweating, so you take your hat off, and your forehead is white, and your face is brown. So we called you Iteskana. Iteska means white forehead. We also called you Awazi, yellow under the arms, because you got leather coats, and you're sweating, and the sweat shows. So we're all very descriptive. And the Assiniboine called us Sahada because our people were the people of the canes, they called us, because we decorate willow canes, and the old people used those canes. And the Soros called us we Wisakwadeinine, means part burnt wood, we're not fully burnt. <laughs> and, uh, 
and the Crees call us Katipemishutzik because we didn't sign treaties. We were owners of our own destiny. They also called us Aptagoshan. That's half of my son. Aptagos is, that's half of my son. So we got names from all over the place. We're still being called names today. But you know, we've evolved to where we've come a long, long ways. I look through the crowd and I see relatives, I see good friends. And we're bringing that, partnering together, even though we've been strangers, we, we work together. I've met, since I've come to the university and I've been working there since last June as a special lecturer and an elder, and I also worked for the Gabriel Dumont Institute, trying to develop language, preservation, and documentation of our story, our history, our legends, and telling people who we are. We've had people, linguists, study us, our language. The best one was Peter Bakker. He now teaches in Aarhus in Denmark. He was a little Dutchman from Holland in Europe. He heard about this language that these people speak. We never knew, we never questioned, because when you've got a powerful community with a powerful language and a powerful culture, powerful history, why would you question who you are? Now we're trying, to, what we're doing now is we're dissecting ourselves to appease other people. But this man came to Canada and he gave us a reawakening because we didn't know that, according to census, that our language, Michif, was endangered. It was an endangered species. We didn't know that. As a matter of fact, I'm the first generation to go to school and maybe I don't know how I learned English because my people spoke broken English and they didn't like English in the first place. Because history told us there was reasons why you wouldn't like that. But we spoke all our relatives' languages. We were very versatile in Soto, like Ojibwe, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota. And we spoke Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, Amun, Nihiao, Omoen different languages, because that we had to, it was like putting on your armor. When you're buffalo hunting and going through other people's territories, you have to know the protocols of, of gifting, feasting, and that's where the tobacco was very powerful. So those were our teachings. One minute in Dikawa. I have to tell you who I am in 20 minutes. That's sad. That's how important I am. But I know I'm a good speaker. Huh? And they would call me if I talked too much at home, they'd say, monkey tone. <laughs> I, as a national elder, I represent the Métis Nation. I was invited to go to a national policy meeting in Vancouver. And um, we're going to talk about things, too, within our organization. Politics is different than education. Because politics have really destroyed a lot of our people. Because when we weren't used to running against somebody, you'd get hurt and then lateral violence would develop from that. And that's hurt us a whole lot. But now that I'm working at the university and they're very willing at the university, as you could see today, about the empowerment and the healing through our visitations, through our celebrations, and we're indigenous people that are indigenizing. And um, 
We're talking about things like enhancement of Indigenous knowledge and education, how to incorporate Indigenous knowledge in everyday teaching, incorporating Indigenous knowledge for the betterment of education, language, history, heritage, all these things that we need. It's very imperative for our self-determination. But Louis Riel said, as his prophecy, my people will sleep for 100 years, but when they awake, it will be the artists who give them their spirits back. And that was in 1885. So with that, that's what we're doing. We're in, inspired by all of you, our relatives. Don't ever forget and be strong. Keep your head up and let's keep working together. I know I missed out some things here, but like one lady said, our language and our culture, our spirituality and our land is the glue to that what makes us who we are. How? Merci. Thank you.